I bet you're wondering why I put a cold steel knife on the end of my walking stick. I do this because it's a convenient way to carry my knife when it's not in its sheath. It is reminiscent of the spontoon that became popular in America after the Revolutionary War. Early explorers carried spontoons as important survival tools. For example, they were carried on the Lewis and Clark expedition of America. Meriwether Lewis describes how his spontoon saved his life when he was fighting a grizzly bear. I've also used my knife attached to a walking stick when I was attacked by feral hogs last year. Fortunately, they were frightened away and they didn't bite me. Uh, the knife with this arrangement is also convenient when cutting thorny vines that cross trails. Vines are very common in this part of Texas, and this is a really good way to um, make a safe path. In the 1800s, the U.S. Army recommended that pioneers carry a rifle and a pistol, but not everyone did that. Some carried spontoons and others, like John Muir, the famous naturalist and explorer who founded the Sierra Club, didn't carry any firearms when walking 1,000 miles from Indiana to Florida in 1867. When you carry a knife on the end of a walking stick, make sure that the sharp side is pointed away from your body. And when the knife isn't in use, take it off your walking stick and put it in a sheath. I'm going to look for some wax myrtle bushes. I think there's some right over there. Oh, here's one. Wax myrtles are sometimes called the mini mart of the forest because they have so many uses. Season food with the leaves and berries. Treat fever, dysentery, and many other health problems. Some people chew the leaves if they have bleeding gums. They don't taste bad either. Wax myrtles have a pleasant aroma that repels mosquitoes. So you can take the leaves, rub them on you, and the mosquitoes will go away. The berries have a wax coating that makes excellent candles. The wax is extracted by boiling the berries and skimming off the hydrocarbons. Wax myrtles were particularly important for candle making during the Civil War. The candles that I'm making are more primitive than what the pioneers made, but they work. I've now made several candles and I'm going to walk down to the river. Do you want to come along? I need the company. I'm getting hungry. It's time to stop for the original trail mix, parched corn. Let me show it to you. I'll get it right out of my haversack. It's wholesome, it's tasty, it's nutritious. You take a small amount of it and uh, put it in your mouth Swallow it with a little bit of water 
and you won't be hungry anymore. It absorbs water in your stomach and swells up. And then you feel full. See the link down below for information about how to make it. This is truly an American trail food. The colonists learned how to make it from the Indians, and it was carried by the Lewis and Clark expedition. It, was, it sustained soldiers during the Civil War. It was popular with the post-war army on the western frontier. And parched corn was a favored food of the pioneers. It's not bad. It's actually very tasty. Try it. You'll like it. I'm collecting Yopan Holly to make tea that has a flavor similar to green tea. Yopan tea is high in antioxidants, plus it has a lot of caffeine. It is the only North American plant that has caffeine in it. It was used by Native Americans for ritual ceremonies and when making important decisions. Now the scientific name of the plant is Ilex vomitoria, but don't let this name fool you. The tea will not cause you to vomit. Vomiting was part of the Indian ceremonies, but the tea didn't cause the vomiting. Yopan berries, right here, these red berries, however, are poisonous and will cause vomiting. So when you collect the tea, you want to avoid the branches that have berries on them. Yopan tea was an important coffee substitute used by the Confederates during the Civil War. Some Southerners like it so much that they drink it today. This is a good spot to set up day camp. I'm going to make lunch. The yopon leaves need to be roasted similar to the way that you roast coffee beans in order to release the caffeine. And so I'm pulling them off the branches. It doesn't matter if I get a few twigs in there. And then I'm going to roast it over the fire. This is almost ready. The Indians blackened it more than I'm going to because they made their tea, a, they called it a black drink because it was strong, and they pulverized all of the, all the leaves. And I'm not going to pulverize it that much because I don't like it that strong. It's almost ready. I'm going to pour it into my can, and then I'm going to boil the water. While it steeps, I'm going to make bacon and eggs. That's going to be my lunch. And the tea looks good. Bacon, eggs, and yopon tea. Bon appetit! Oh, that tea is really good. Mosquitoes, black flies, and other biting insects will annoy you almost year-round in Southeast Texas. And uh, during the day, it isn't so bad because your motion sort of keeps them away, but it's really annoying at night. And so the best thing to do is to cover up. I use mosquito netting. And you don't need to buy an official fancy mosquito netting. You can get this at the country store, Walmart. And uh, it's only a few dollars a yard. And this is enough that I have oh, for two people to be sleeping in overnight and cover their whole bodies. But I want to show you how to use this. If you just need to be covered, your head covered, you, you don't really want to cut this netting into a smaller piece, but here it's folded in half, and you can just tuck it underneath your collar. And tucking it underneath your collar will keep the, uh, the insects out. So 
Again, you don't have to buy anything fancy. You know, there, there are these fancy hats that have mosquito netting. Don't, don't bother with them. Use the same netting that you will use to cover your, your wool blanket when you're sleeping outdoors. I'll show you how to set the netting up when you're sleeping outdoors with a wool blanket in a later episode. Another thing that you can do is if the insects are getting into your legs, say you have chiggers where they crawl, what you might want to do when there are a lot of chiggers is to put your socks over your pants and that way they won't be able to crawl inside. Smoke from a campfire is yet another thing you can use to keep mosquitoes away. In fact, a smoky fire is really the best thing. Now, as you know, sometimes the smoke comes towards you and sometimes it doesn't. To solve that problem, what I recommend is use an old pot, maybe the one you just cooked your, your meal in, if that's what you have, and take a couple of coals and put those coals into the pot. Okay, I've got a couple of coals here. So now I have sort of a, a smoky fire here. And I add the leaves of wax myrtle. As you know, wax myrtle repels mosquitoes. So this smoky fire is going to smell good and it will also repel mosquitoes. Now you can move then this smudge around to different areas so that you stay free of insects. You could even walk around with this little smudge pot. I'm collecting Spanish moss to make a pillow for my bed in the cabin. Spanish moss is a flowering plant that hangs from trees and takes nourishment from the air and water. It uses trees only for support, and it's not a parasite. It's a bromeliad, the same family as pineapples. In the 1800s, people often stuffed mattresses with Spanish moss straw and grasses, since only the rich could afford feather and down beds. Folks soon discovered that these natural materials were also hiding places for chiggers and other biting invertebrates, leading to the phrase, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. So if you decide to make a bed or a pillow with Spanish moss, be sure to heat it first to kill the creepy crawlers. I have enough for now. I can always come back for more. Let's head back to the cabin. I want to show you my bed and how I'm going to use the pillow. Sweet home is an excellent pillow. Let's see how my bed is stuffed. <laughs> 